Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to this first webinar in a series on the Chesapeake Bay and planning for clean water. Very good to see you all. This is Laura Backel. I'm with the Eastern Research Group. And we're going to start off with a poll question. So we'd like to get an idea of who, who's uh, uh, tuning in today. So if you could please just let us know, where are you located? We'll give you a few minutes to do that, one or two. Okay, thank you, Martina. So it looks like uh, we've got uh, people from New York, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Delaware, Washington, DC, Virginia, West Virginia, and also other, if, if you uh, answered other, uh, be interested to uh, just put where you're located in the chat. That'd be interesting to know. So it looks like we've got people from, ooh, Outer Banks, Annapolis. Well, that's great. Colorado, terrific. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing that. So welcome, everybody, again. Um, we're going to get started here, if I can advance my slides, just to go over some of the uh, important information about continuing uh, education credits. You can go ahead and uh, search for the event uh, by the number uh, or by the sponsor name. Um, then just click add to my log for that. And for CEC credits, just email me and I will provide you with a certificate on uh, credits. So we're gonna move to Martina. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. And APA Virginia is uh, thrilled to be part of this series and this group. A um, couple quick housekeeping. Uh, APA Virginia is happy to help support this from a logistic standpoint. Um, we are using Zoom webinar for this series. So just a quick reminder, throughout the um, webinar presentation, we encourage you to chat with each other using the chat function. But um, when we get to the Q&A portion, I encourage you to use the Q&A box to submit your questions Throughout the presentation, please submit your questions in that Q&A box. We will take those in the order they're received when we get to the Q&A portion, or you can use the raise hand icon. And what we'll do with that is when we see your hand raised, we can actually allow you to unmute yourself and turn your camera on if you like to ask your question live and engage with our presenters one-on-one um, -on -one, uh, rather than just typing your question in um, during the Q&A portion. If you have any questions or tech issues, you know, feel free to send me a message in the chat box as well. I'm happy to help. As a reminder, this is being recorded. I'll put a link to um, the Mid-Atlantic Planning Collaboration YouTube page where you'll be able to find this recording as well as we will send this out in an email with the supportive materials. Um, but you can always email admin at apavirginia.com if you have any questions about that. So those are our housekeeping announcements and um, we're here as a resource if you need anything. Thanks so much, Laura, for letting us be a part. Thank you. So um, thanks, Martina, again, for, for the housekeeping. And especially thank, thank you to the Mid-Atlantic Planning Collaborator for hosting this webinar series and the Maryland chapter of APA for facilitating this first webinar. I'm Laura Backel. I'm with the Eastern Research Group. It's my pleasure to be working on this initiative, building closer ties between local planners and the Chesapeake Bay partners. No panel of presenters embodies this close tie better than the people we will hear from today. First, we will have a presentation from Michelle Edwards, giving us an understanding of the Bay restoration work and how it benefits local government. Then we will have a panel discussion featuring local planners, 
from all across the watershed who support and advise the Chesapeake Bay program. But first, it's my honor to hand the baton to Helen Spinelli and let me tell you a little bit about her. Ms. Spinelli is currently the president of the Maryland chapter of the American Planning Association and has served in that role since 2020. She's an adjunct professor at Morgan State University Graduate School of Architecture and Planning. Ms. Spinelli served as a public sector planner in, in the state of Maryland for over 30 years as both a current planner and a long range planner and ended her career as a principal planner for Queen Anne's County, Maryland in 2019. And previously she was chief of community environmental planning for Queen Anne County. She served as director of economic development in Caroline County, Maryland and, and, and infrastructure planner in Carroll County and Anne Arundel County. Ms. Spinelli holds an MA and BA degrees in economics from Fordham University, New York and an honors economics degree from Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. She lives on the Eastern shore of Maryland. Take it away, Helen. Thank you so much and uh, for that um, introduction and um, also for uh, uh, Laura for organizing this, this whole uh, webinar series. It's, you've done a great job, both Laura's. So what I wanted to start out with is that this has been um, a long time coming and there's some other people in the background. One of them, particularly um, Gina Hunt, who was from DNR and uh, the Chesapeake Bay program who actually went ahead and um, asked this be funded by the um, by uh, the Chesapeake Bay program. So I'm really, really thrilled that this all came to fruition. And it actually started about five years ago when the Maryland APA has a tradition of doing what they call mobile workshops. And I did two of them down at the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science at Horn Point. And the first one was translating science for, uh, for um, environmental quality and, and uh, planning. And the second one was, how is that habitat working for you? So these, this webinar series emanated from trying to get science joined with planning and to give planners the basis of science for everything they do, because it, it is such an important foundation and it gives you so much credibility if you have your scientists with you with all of the um, planning that you do. So that's how it started. Um, I'm just thrilled to be here and I hope many of our members, be, um, the Maryland chapter of APA are here and some of my students from Morgan maybe. So anyway, thank you very much. And I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Michelle and I'm gonna have to put on my glasses probably because I did 30 years of planning, I need to do this. Um, <laughs> so Michelle Edwards is currently a regional planner with the Rappahannock and Rapidan Regional Commission in Virginia, where she has managed the planning districts, environmental and natural resource programs for the last past 10 years. Michelle previously worked as an environmental planner with the Virginia Department of Conservation and Recreation and as a contractor for the US um, Environmental Protection Agency's Office of Water. She holds a BS in Environmental Studies from Bucknell and a Master's in Public Affairs degree in Environmental Policy and Natural Resource Management from Indiana University. Additionally, she is an appointed member of the Virginia Chesapeake Bay Stakeholders Advisory Group and Vice Chair of the Bay Program's Local Leadership Work, um, workshop, work Group. Um, very good. Thank you. Um, I'm turning it over to Michelle. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Helen. So I am here today to provide an overview of the Chesapeake Bay program, beginning with some basic facts on the Bay watershed. Then we're going to talk about the regulatory and organizational framework of the Bay program. And finally, local government's role in this effort. So beginning with some facts about the Bay, the Chesapeake Bay watershed includes the states of Virginia, West Virginia, Maryland, Pennsylvania, Delaware, New York, and Washington, DC. From the streams in that watershed, 51 billion gallons of water flow into the Bay on a daily basis. The 64,000 square mile watershed contains close to 12,000 miles of shoreline, more than four trips between Annapolis and Los Angeles. But the watershed includes more than water. 
including over 18 million people living here with 9% of the watershed's land use being taken up by suburban and urban development. But most of the land use is forest land at 58% and farmland at 22%. Although we all know that those numbers are not static and new development continues to chip away at those forest and ag land per percentages. The Bay is also a unique estuary compared to others in the United States. It's very shallow relative to land area that drains to it with an average depth of only 21 feet. The positive side is, of this is habitat. It provides shallow waters, provides important habitat for blue crabs, oysters, juvenile fish, and waterfowl. Unfortunately, with less water to handle the pollution that washes in from the land, the bay is very susceptible to pollution compared to many other estuaries. One of these pollutants, which the latest round of watershed implementation plans focused on is nitrogen. Nitrogen pollution comes from a range of sources, including agricultural runoff carrying excess fertilizer and animal waste, air pollution, urban stormwater runoff from parking lots, roofs, and other impervious surfaces, discharges from wastewater treatment plants and factories, and finally at 4% failing septic systems leaching into groundwater and eventually draining into the bay. So next we're gonna talk about the regulatory and organizational framework of the Bay Program, beginning with the Clean Water Act in 1972. Followed by in 1983, we had the Chesapeake Bay Agreement between the Environmental Protection Agency, Washington DC and the other Bay States, which established the Bay Program. Then following a lawsuit, EPA set federal pollution limits in 2010 better known as the Bay TMDL or total maximum daily load, which we'll talk about in more detail in a little bit. But the program is still evolving. The latest agreement between the Bay States and EPA was signed in 2014. And finally, in 2020, the program's executive council released a statement in support of diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. So delving a little deeper, the Federal Clean Water Act provides the legal basis for water quality protection programs, including the Bay TMDL. Its purpose is to prevent pollution, assist publicly owned wastewater treatment facilities, maintain the integrity of wetlands, and secure fishable, swimmable, drinkable water. The Bay TMDL itself, which stands for total maximum daily load, is sometimes referred to as the Bay's pollution diet. TMDLs in general set limits on the amount of specific pollutants that can enter a water body and are the means of meeting federal water quality standards. Specifically, the, Bay TM, the Chesapeake Bay TMDL is designed to ensure all pollution control measures needed to fully restore the Chesapeake Bay and its tidal tributaries are in place by 2025. It focuses on reducing nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment. These are pollutants that harm commercially and recreationally valuable species and make recreation unsafe. It's required under the US Clean Water Act, as I mentioned, prompted by insufficient progress of restoration efforts and continued poor water quality in the Bay. It is the largest and most complex TMDL program in the country. The most recent Chesapeake Bay agreement signed by the Bay States included outcomes organized under these 10 goals you see here for a fully restored Bay. Each goal included between one and five outcomes. While the goals focus on the big picture, the outcomes are specific measurable targets that contribute to achieving each goal. The Bay program then tracks progress on these outcomes and you can visit www.chesapeakeprogress.com for the data and further information. We also have the WIPs or the Watershed Implementation Plans, which each Bay State is required to submit to EPA for approval. Most recently, Phase 3 WIPs were submitted to AP EPA in 2019. They detail how and when the jurisdiction, the, the Bay States and DC will meet the nutrient reduction targets given by EPA to meet the Bay TMDL by 2025. The key elements are pollution reduction goals, current capacity to achieve those goals, strategy for increasing capacity to meet needs from each state, alternative reduction strategies and contingency plans, tracking and reporting protocols, 
estimates of additional loads due to growth and how to offset them. WIP-3 involved local governments in the process. In Virginia, the planning district commissions were tasked with facilitating input from local governments and other local stakeholder groups to develop urban BMP input decks, programmatic actions, and what we would need in order to complete those actions. And PDCs like ours are now contracted by Virginia DEQ to assist with WIP implementation. Behind this regulatory and policy framework, at its heart, the Bay Program is thousands of people working together across the watershed to meet the goals of the Chesapeake Watershed Agreement. The Bay Program is led by the Executive Council made up of the governors of each Bay State, the Mayor of DC, the Chair of the Chesapeake Bay Commission, and the Administrator of EPA. The Council sets the policy direction for the partnership, but the Bay Program partnership also includes 19 federal agencies, nearly 40 state agencies and programs, nearly 2,000 local governments represented through the Local Government Advisory Committee and the work group that I'm a member of, more than 20 academic institutions represented through the Scientific and Technical Advisory Committee, and also more than 60 non-governmental organizations, including businesses, nonprofits, and ag fleet groups. So we try very much to get everyone at the table. The benefits of this regional partnership are many, including most importantly, information sharing and collaboration webinars like these, for example. And they provide the ability to pool resources, which in turn provides cost savings for each jurisdiction. We're all not out there trying to recreate the wheel. It also provides accountability among the partner jurisdictions, plus natural resources don't recognize jurisdictional boundaries, streams don't stop at the county or state line. So beyond federal and state requirements, why should local planners care about water quality? While the Bay Program is a regional effort, the effects of water pollution are indeed local. In a survey of 826 Virginia voters, for example, the top three most concerning environmental issues were contamination of tap water, drinking water supplies, and local streams and lake. lakes. The reason for this comes down to public health and economics. For example, the tourism industry loses about $1 billion each year because of, harmful, because of nutrient pollution and harmful algal blooms. Toxic algae called cyanobacteria grow in fresh and salt water polluted by nutrients and are lethal to animals, including humans. It's not just surface water though, it also deals with groundwater, drinking well water polluted by excess fertilizers, especially dangerous for pregnant women and infants. And as you can see by this table here, which describes the percentage of state area with nitrate contamination in groundwater, this is an especial problem in Delaware and Maryland, but occurs in all of the Bay States. So clean water and healthy watershed are critical to economic development and public safety, as I mentioned, but also infrastructure maintenance and finance and education. A healthy watershed attracts businesses, creates jobs and provides safe drinking water and food for our families, which in turn creates and supports thriving community communities. Local leaders who know about their water resources can then implement economic and policy incentives that support local conservation actions while also meeting other community needs, such as reduced flooding, increased recreational opportunities and associated public health benefits, less frequent dredging of ponds and lakes, main street beautification from street tree planting and rain gardens and green jobs. One of the an anecdotes that I like to talk about is the Save the Crabs and Eat Them public awareness campaign that the Bay Program did a number of years ago, which relied on this idea of co-benefits. It focused on something their target audience in the DC metro area cared about, namely seafood rather than environmental protection, guilt, or warm fuzzies that normal environmental campaigns deal with. So, in some, if you want to do more than preach to the choir, we need to emphasize these indirect benefits of water quality protection, talk about local streams and local benefits rather than the Chesapeake Bay. So delving deeper into the economic benefits, 
um, tying it back to the Save the Crabs and Eat Then campaign, you can see that fisheries in the watershed are worth millions of dollars each year, both 80 million for blue crabs, 45 million for oysters, 80 million from fishing license. This table here in the middle talks about recreational fishing by state with New York State spending more than $2 billion annually and on recreational fishing and 20,000 jobs supported and the other states aren't far behind. Beyond fishing licenses, clean water also promotes increased tourism, visits to local businesses, hunting revenues, local breweries which use that water and robust agriculture. Clean water can also raise the value of a nearby home up to 25%. So what is local government's role in this process? There's a lot of tools and resources that our panel will talk about and also other presentations in the series will delve more into. Firstly, policy and ordinance development is the obvious from stormwater management ordinances to hazard mitigation plans and tree planting ordinances. Also land use planning and zoning tools, which are planners bread and butter, such as watershed shed overlay districts, green infrastructure mapping and purchase of development right programs. Also environmental education is outreach and outreach is something that local governments can do, such as this um, picture shows signage in a park in Culpeper where I live that talks about the local watershed and how it fits in with the bay. Also, um, pet waste management campaigns. And finally, collaboration on common issues and solution, both between local government departments, which can tend to be stovepipe, making sure those within your local government are talking to each other about these issues, as well as communicating with local citizens, NGO, the private sector, and other local state and gov federal government partners. So you're communicating all the way up to the chain and providing input. So that's all I have today. Thank you very much. Helen, I'll turn it over to you, I guess. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I think actually it's going to Laura to do a poll question. Yep, we've got another poll question. Get that up here. Thank you very much. Okay. So our second poll question um, after the informative overview that Michelle gave us is uh, what Bay program or state agency resources do you use in your work? We've got a bunch listed there and we'd like to give you a few minutes to be able to answer that. Um, if you uh, have a different answer from any of the selections here, just go ahead and put that in the chat. So we'll give people a few minutes to answer that poll question. And just as a reminder, uh, please do type your questions in the chat or the Q&A box. Um, we re reserve uh, time to answer questions at the end. And we'll also be looking at those questions as we go uh, to the panel Q&A. Okay, we've got some results to share here. So it, wow, this is really great. So it looks like about 70% of the participants uh, use uh, GIS data layers from their state. 
50% uh, use layers from US Geological Survey. 66% um, use interactive online mapping applications. 31% use static maps. 16% um, uh, use some decision support tools. It'd be interesting to know uh, which ones you're using if you uh, have uh, you want to share some information about that. 31% uh, use uh, planning advisory uh, service reports. 46% uh, best management practice reports. Um, and then 42% uh, use information from state agency webinars. And 11% uh, use CAST, which we're, we're going to learn a little bit more about. So that's, that's wonderful. Thank you very much for sharing that. And just continue to put in the uh, chat uh, or, or Q&A some other things that you use. So now we're going to transition over to the panel. Um, and I'm going to be handing it back over to Helen to do the introductions on the panel and to hear a little bit more about our panel, panel members. Thank you so much, Laura. And um, I do want to do one apology. I have a nine month old puppy and he um, got a little rambunctious this morning. So all the barking you heard was moose. He's called the moose. So um, let me introduce Mark Dobbins, who was born and raised in North Carolina and grew up in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains. Weren't you lucky? <laughs> Following high school, he enlisted in the Navy and served as a field corpsman assigned to the US Marine Corps with a service in Beirut, Beirut, Lebanon. He received a BS in biology from Towson University and is currently pursuing his MBA at the University of Delaware. Uh, he is employed at the, by the University of Delaware for, for, for 12 years and currently holds a position of senior business officer for the College of Earth, Ocean and Environmental Responsibility respons and is responsible for finance, budget, and human resources. In his previous position, he was a manager grants administrator for the University of Delaware College of Engineering. Mark lives in the town of Northeast Maryland, where he chairs the planning commission, serves as president of the Elk and Northeast Rivers Watershed Association and is Cecil County Master Watershed Steward. Very well done. And um, next panelist is Pam. Schallenberger, and she is, has a 37 years career in York County Planning Commission with the York County Planning Commission. Pamela um, is, has held a, a variety of positions. Currently, she is Chief of Long Range Planning Division and manages a staff of six planners. Primary responsibilities include development and implementation of the county's comprehensive plan, the countywide action plan for clean waters, as well as administration of the York County Regional Chesapeake Bay Pollutant Reduction Plan for the York County Stormwater Consortium. Additionally, Pam serves as vice chair of the Manor Township Lancaster County Planning Commission and secretary treasurer of the APA PA Central Section. She serves um, on the Chesapeake Bay Program Local Leadership Work Group, um, the Lancaster Conservancy Land Protection Committee, and numerous other committees. She has a BS in degree in urban and regional planning from Indiana University of Pennsylvania. And then our next panelist is Danny Lappin. Danny Lappin is a community revitalization specialist with the New York State um, Oh, sorry, New York State Department of State's Office of Planning, Development, and Community Infrastructure. Prior to that, he was environmental planner for Otsego Ot County C Conservation Association in Cooperstown, New York. Um, Mr. Lappin facilitated OCCA's Circuit Plan uh, Rider Planner Program, where he assisted communities with the development of comprehensive plans, agriculture and farmland protection pl plans, and watershed management plans. Uh, Mr. Lappin occasionally participates as an unofficial representative from the New York in the Chesapeake Bay Program Local Government Advisory Committee. Mr. Lappin also serves as chair of this as a city of um, Aniato, I'm sorry, I don't get this right, Planning Commission, and I should know this because I'm from New York, um, and the city of Oneto Housing Commission. In his spare time, uh, Mr. Lappin enjoys gardening, playing baseball, basketball, and playing with his dog, Coco. Okay, 
So um, those are our panelists and I'm really thrilled to have them. And it's such a diverse group um, that, you know, from, um, from our, our states. So I'm gonna ask, actually, I'm gonna ask Pam first, what are the water quality goals of your jurisdiction? And, and um, go ahead and, and I'll mute myself and you can go. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as a representative of York County, our water quality goals are to clean up our impaired waters as well as continue to maintain and improve um, all other waters in the county to prevent them from becoming impaired. Um, our goals are also to educate the public, which includes residents, businesses, the agricultural community, and others about the importance of water quality and to engage them in our water quality efforts. And finally, um, one of our goals is to learn the true quality of our um, waters in York County through a uh, robust um, water quality monitoring program that we implemented in the past two years. Thank you, Pam. That's those are lofty goals, but I hope they're attainable. <laughs> <laughs> well, they are if we have if we all do it together. Um, I'm going to switch it to Danny Lappin. Go ahead, Danny. Can you answer that question? Do you want me to repeat the question? Sure. I what, mean, <laughs> yeah. What are I the mean, water quality goals so guess, for your jurisdiction for the state? I guess. I mean, <laughs> I, I guess for for New York. Um, the Chesapeake Bay watershed covers 19 counties in New York State. Our primary goals are to um, protect um, our water streams, lakes, uh, creeks, rivers, other water bodies in the state to make sure our water quality um, is being maintained and improved where applicable. Um, we want to make sure that we the state provides resources to the agricultural community, soil and water conservation districts and other entities working to actively improve uh, water quality. We're trying to make sure that a lot of the progressive um, stormwater management, wastewater management techniques that New York State employs are receive credit in the Chesapeake Bay program for water quality reductions. Um, and at the same time, um, we're trying to uh, really make sure that um, our local governments and county, including county, towns, village, city, are all actively working in a coordinated way in the Chesapeake Bay watershed to protect water quality as well. So those are kind of like the broad goals. I mean, the main, the main thing is to help um, the ag sector uh, meet its TMDL goals mm. and to help you know the developed sector and wastewater sector as well do the same thing. Yeah, that's that's a big that's a real challenge when I um, we were. Um, uh, anyway, that's the biggest challenge in Maryland, certainly the ag sector. And let me turn it over to um, Mark and see what the University of Delaware is, uh, how you interpret that for, through your college there. Um, well, I try to stay out of, I'm, I'm in the business of finance <laughs> and, and management at the University of Delaware. So I try to keep my, uh, my <laughs> other roles away from my uh, full-time paying job there uh, as much as I would like to uh, it, it is very interesting and I see a lot of um, a lot of synergy between the work that our college does primarily focusing on the Delaware Bay um, and what I do in my roles to chair of the Planning Commission and other the watershed Association uh, the town of Northeast is a very small municipality at the very head of the bay um, we are very much focused on partnerships. The town of Northeast has been a tremendous supporter, supporter of the Elkin Northeast Watershed Association. We've expanded uh, our water quality uh, monitoring program in both the Northeast and the Elk Rivers. Um, the Northeast River is a significant source of residential water supply. So we have a very, very much a vested interest in maintaining the quality, not only with the uh, the TMDLs, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment, but also uh, making sure that we're cognizant of uh, the public health. Uh, testing is done uh, throughout the river for uh, other uh, bacteria that, and, and other contaminants that we're not able to, uh, to test for uh, right. from a funding standpoint. So the town of Northeast focuses on partnerships with NGOs and with Cecil County uh, to make sure that we're uh, actively engaged in maintaining as high quality as the Northeast River and improving the quality uh, because of that residential water source. 
Thank you very much, Mark. And I, I should have referred to you to Northeast, um, uh, which I'm very familiar with. Um, I used to run the circuit rider program there uh, for the state. So um, I also wanted to check, uh, I'm gonna read my next question, but um, how does your jurisdiction, and if it's the state, then let's go ahead and have that as well, allocate resources, staff, funding, to advancing your water quality goals. And I'm gonna start with Danny to see um, how, you know, we saw that how much money you, that, this, that New York allocates for uh, recreation. I wanted to see how much they were doing for, um, for water quality. Um, I can't particularly speak to the state level, but what I can say for the, um, for our region, our, my county where I work in mainly, um, the county appropriates um, approx Otsego County, which is at the headwaters of the New York portion of the Chesapeake Bay watershed, and actually the headwaters of the Susquehanna River. Um, our county appropriates just under $200,000 to its soil and water conservation district. Um, and the soil and water conservation district as a quasi governmental agency is the primary entity responsible for working with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, the Upper Susquehanna Coalition and other entities to, to meet the Chesapeake Bay uh, water quality goals. Um, recently, um, starting in 2018, the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation um, funded my former organization, the Otsego County Conservation Association to start developing um, local level watershed management plans through its circuit writer planner program. And we've been trying to identify additional funding pathways for local governments, um, to mainly towns and villages to develop self-sustaining funding mechanisms at the very, you know, very, very local level to implement water quality projects as well. Because what we do recognize is that while uh, New York State <coughs> actively invests in water quality protection, more additional resources are needed to help our local governments, you know, be a more active partner in meeting the Chesapeake Bay program goals. Unmute. Um, so let me turn it over to Pam and see what York County is doing, please. From a staffing point, um, York County has hired a full-time water resources coordinator. We also have a full-time countywide action plan for clean waters um, coordinator. And we have an additional three staff persons that um, spend a bulk of their time on um, watershed and water planning initiatives in, in the county. And we've also entered into a cost share agreement with um, USGS for our water quality um, monitoring program. The county um, pays for the actual monitors and maintenance of them and USGS covers all the um, data side of things and reporting uh, <clears throat> results back to us. Um, the county also puts up a match money every year to participate in the Army Corps of Engineers planning assistance to states program, which is um, for planning initiatives. And all of those initiatives have helped um, gone toward our water quality goals, such as um, they've provided assistance in development of our regional Chesapeake Bay pollutant reduction plan, um, assisted with mapping our stormwater assets throughout the county, and are now um, looking to help us with a stream delisting program to get our impaired waters um, cleaned up and how to prioritize getting that done. Um, the county is also a participant in that regional Chesapeake Bay pollutant reduction plans and um, provides a staff member, which is myself, to help um, administer that program on behalf of the York County Stormwater Consortium. And additionally, um, within the past um, two years, the county approved a tax increase which is going to support a um, land protection program. And of course, protecting and preserving land, you know, helps to um, improve our water quality. And that part of that program is providing addition, um, those tax dollars are going to providing fun additional funding for our county parks department, the conservation district, the Ag Land Preserve Board and the county's um, Farm and Natural Lands Trust. And we've also, as part of that, created a grant program um, a portion of the grant program is for acquisition of land for public use 
And the other part of that is a um, planning grant program for municipalities to um, update their plans or their ordinances to incorporate land protection provisions, green infrastructure, low impact development and other um, features into their plans and ordinances. Thank you so much, Pam. And, and it sounds like you have a lot of, uh, you know, um, activities and resources for, um, for through your county. Um, Mark, I was going to ask you what's happening in Northeast and how you're getting supported through, um, you know, through the county and through the state for your um, for uh, uh, water quality. Um, one of the things, um, of course, in a small municipality like ours, we do rely on the county for any of our uh, on the planning commission. Uh, much, the, many of our permits are uh, handled at the county level, and, and we're appreciative of that. The town, the town of Northeast, um, committed resources to uh, meeting M MS4 uh, general permit guidelines as oh, a contract yeah. consultant. Uh, in 2018, which has been very informative. We utilized the uh, the Northeast River watershed assessment, uh, which was originally done, I think in 2013 and updated in 2019 to inform uh, what we enter in, partnerships that we enter into, for example, with the Elk and Northeast River Watershed Association. This is a great source of projects, many of which the county already has a design for. So we can partner, uh, we can leverage um, in our watershed association, the uh, the um, the volunteer as volunteer uh, capacity that we have, and the town has the capacity of their public works group. Uh, a great example of that is a microbioretention facility that was we we finished as part of the Watershed Steward Academy capstone project uh, in in around 2016. We had a, a significant problem with uh, water intrusion into the town meeting hall and installing, updating that facility from a, about a 4,000 square foot parking area has remedied that problem over the last several years. But that was a, a partnership uh, between the town, the, the county and the Watershed Steward Academy uh, and with our volunteer capacity. Uh, so in a small municipality, just like every other planning department, uh, there's staffing challenges. We have to be very careful what we commit to and from a planning commission standpoint we have to be careful uh what conditions we impose on uh applicants and folks that appear before the commission because those condi those conditions have to be reviewed by our planning staff and so we have a planning director and a planning assistant uh who are responsible for all aspects including code enforcement so we have to be cautious about um what we have, we have to be very intentional on things that we commit to and grant proposals. And uh, we do have a new circuit rider program uh, that, um, and I have to meet with her in the next month or two um, in, in, in a couple of my capacities. So uh, we're very fortunate to get uh, some very strong support from Cecil County Department of Public Works uh, and able to augment that with, with funding from our own municipality. Um, I'm, I'm so glad to hear about the circuit rider program. So um, I think some of you have answered this question. So I'm gonna put it to the panel um, generally, um, how do you work with other departments to achieve mutual benefits? And I think um, if, if there was something else that you thought that the, um, all of our participants in this webinar should hear, I think some of you have answered that. So just, um, you can just um, go ahead and unmute yourself, either um, Mark, uh, Pam or Danny, whichever one you want to do, please. Um, I'll just mention that um, in our county that we've created a committee that includes representatives of our facilities management department, um, the county prison, um, the conservation district and the planning commission, as well as county parks and our county administrator to look at how we can coordinate water quality improvements on county lands and also um, work with the community when it relates to the conservation district and um, outreach to the to the ag community. Another thing um, we've done is um, our, we administer the community development block grant program and we've added bonus points into the applications when an applicant is proposing a project and incorporates green infrastructure um, components into the, to the project to um, help reach our goals as well. 
And also um, through the York County Ag Land Preserve Board, one of their requirements is that you have to have a conservation and plan to be eligible for their program. And by working with them, we are um, more strongly promoting implementation of those conservation plans to get um, best management practices in place throughout the agricultural community and on those preserved farms, which has been um, very beneficial. Thank you, Pam. And um, I'm going to turn it over to Michelle because she's on the panel too, and I somehow didn't um, didn't really uh, focus on that. But I'd really like to hear from uh, Virginia on what um, on some of these issues, water quality, which you talked about in your presentation. But really, I'd like to know how the jurisdictions in Virginia participate, or how you reach out regionally and things like that. Thank you, Michelle. Sure. Um well, as I mentioned in Virginia, the Bay PDCs, the planning district commissions have been contracted by Virginia Department of Environmental Quality to address WIP implementation with our local governments. So I know in my PDC, um, we, through the WIP, identified needs for better BMP tracking and data sharing as being one of our hurdles conservation of existing forest land and implementation of low impact development BMPs like bioretention facilities, rain gardens, and constructed wetlands. So we've been kind of whittling down that list with our local governments. Um, we currently have a local TMDL implementation that we've been working on that has been kind of guided by um, the BMP input deck that we provided through the WIP. So you know, those bioretention facilities were emphasized. Um, and also um, we've been developing a regional watershed implementation plan to kind of pull together some of those data needs because we noticed that no one entity had the data. There was a lot of gaps in our data that the WIP identified. Um, so we've been really working with our partners both at the state and federal level and our local governments. We're a very rural area. We have two MS4s. We have a town and a county that are MS4s and the rest um, do not operate their own stormwater programs. The state operates them for them. So they're voluntary programs. Does, so we, excuse me, Michelle. Does sure. everyone know what an MS4 is? I just, would you mind? Oh, sure. Yes, thank you. Um, <laughs> well, it's not, I mean, I just, I know what it is. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, so it's municipal separate stormwater, storm sewer system, and it is permitted. They're required to do stormwater by um, federal law. So that's overseen by EPA and DEQ. The rest of them, it's, a, it's voluntary if they want to implement a stormwater program or not. Otherwise, in Virginia, DEQ handles the program, which is the case for my localities for the most part, other than those two. Um, we've also been working with the Chesapeake Conservancy to develop an online BMP prioritization tool. So for a locality or a county or even a farm can determine what BMPs, what, what urban or ag BMPs would work best given their situation um, to kind of prior to kind of look at what would be the most efficient way of tackling the problem rather than just to say scattershot whatever um, works works um, to create a better prioritization system. We've also been working with our MF MS4s through grants to fund municipal stormwater retrofit projects. We have a NIFWF grant that we've been working with to do that. They have some SLAF grants that they've been working on, which is um, a state Virginia grant program for stormwater. Um, we've been working with DOF to provide an app that tracks tree planting that DOF has. So for example, when people are going to Lowe's, they have an app that they can track that they've planted a tree and someone will come and verify that to kind of get at that tracking issue. And then finally, the Healthy Watershed Forest Initiative that we've been working with um, both uh, DEQ and DOF, Department of Forestry, and the Rappahannock River Basin Commission to encourage forest land preservation through carbon trading. 
So that we've we've had a lot on our plate over the last few years. Thank you. That that really, if if I felt there was a gap in anything, that certainly filled it. Thank you very much. And <laughs> and um, I do appreciate you explaining your acronyms. Um, they're they're it, that's such a challenge for all of us yes. because uh, we live in alphabet soup for sure. I do. Um, so. I guess if someone has anything, um, maybe I know Pam talked about her partnerships quite a bit. Um, maybe Danny can address partnerships with other jurisdictions sure. and uh, regional partners. But the other sector that hasn't really been talked about here is the um, is the private sector. And I think we can use uh, private nonprofits too um, as the private sector. So if anybody has anything. Sorry. Yeah, Danny. Um, from for me, um, one of the most. I mean, I can say it's a guinea pig program, but in my opinion, I would make a strong argument that the private non-profit sector can fill a strong gap in terms of interorganizational partnerships. Yeah. My previous organization, the Otsego County Conservation Association, offered a 50/50 cost share program for municipalities with identified planning needs to receive valuable consulting services that they normally wouldn't be able to provide. Um, if you took a straw poll in our region, you know, I would argue in the 19 county region, there'd only be a handful of municipalities that could afford an expensive consultant without a substantial federal or state grant. So we fill those kind of small contract needs and how that kind of materializes in an actual product is, we worked um, in, in a uh, large watershed in the Western part of Otsego County, which covered about 10 municipalities. And we developed a watershed uh, protection plan that they came you know, at, a, at no cost to the communities. It was through a state contract actually. Um, but what we did is we used CAST to prioritize BMPs and priority projects that a previous infrastructure studies had identified. And we identified a series of like, um, you know, BMPs that would receive credit that would achieve the most substantial reductions for the lowest cost possible. And so the CAST tools and the trainings from Olivia Devereaux were so super helpful in helping us do that. But that what that did is that enabled a county that wouldn't be able to take advantage of existing programs due to a lack of technical capacity and technical understanding to take advantage of a really effective planning service that my organization offered and also um, you know, dedicate state level attention to a community that would be traditionally underserved. And, um, and then what it also accomplished from the political side is that um, communities that normally wouldn't think of environmental protection initiatives or water quality protection initiatives as being a good thing, being very resistant to government overreach and government regulation, they realized that the Chesapeake Bay program was a, a really strong way to protect their ag sector while improving their um, physical and natural infrastructure. Um, thank you very much, Danny. And, and I have to say when I was in my jurisdiction, we partnered um, Chesapeake Bay um, Foundation and um, a, a lot of our conservation groups and it was really successful. So um, I wanted to also um, someone, asked um, about Michelle to explain your um, Department of Forestry tree planting app. Uh, could you do that? Um, or you can answer that, um, that'd be great. Um, I'm not sure how much I can explain this uh, other than to say that it is an online app that um, your standard homeowners can access. It also can be used for community tree plantings that they essentially fill in their basic information and then someone comes to verify it because it's not enough to just say you planted it. Potentially people can, could um, make something up or the tree could not do well. So it, time is, is um, elapses and then someone comes to verify that the tree is still alive essentially from um, typically um, it's like a friends of group, like friends of the Rappahannock, somebody who has knowledge to be able to verify it. It's not DOF per se that comes by and verifies it. Um, okay. that's, that's as much as I they can could probably go and find the app too. Yes. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Um, there was also, um, Danny answered the question on the chat about the circuit rider program in New York. And that's uh, the, 
and I, I'm, I'm sure Mark could answer it, but um, just to tell you, that's the same model that we have in Maryland. It's a 50-50 program, uh, the state and the local jurisdiction, especially small jurisdictions. Um, and we put planners and town managers in um, small jurisdictions um, and sometimes part-time, sometimes full-times. So it's, um, it's a very, very popular and very, very helpful program to small jurisdictions. Mark, do you want to say anything to that? I don't get involved. I don't think I could add uh, value to what, what you just said. I'm aware of it. It's not something that I'd interact with um, day to day either within the planning commission or the or the uh, the watershed association. Thank you. Um, if there's, um, I guess I wanted to just turn it over to the panel if there was anything, um, Michelle, Pam, Danny, and Mark, if there was anything else you wanted to add um, to highlight um, about um, you know, projects prior um, or anything else that you would like to for the um, all our participants to to be aware of. Um, so if um, if you want to speak to it or you can put it in the chat, whichever whichever is you're comfortable with. Just uh, mention from I, the uh, sector standpoint. Um, go ahead, Pam. Been, um, from a private sector standpoint, we have been working begun working with the um, landscapers and promoting um, sustainable um, landscaping to them. And we're being successful in having a number of them now become certified as sustainable landscapers. And a group of them are also now helping us to update our sustainable landscaping model ordinance. So um, that's been a real advantage. And another one from um, private would be um, the industrial stormwater permittees. They have obligations to meet from a water quality stormwater standpoint as well. And so if we can work cooperatively together and get mutual benefits from that, not only for them to meet their permit, but for municipalities to meet MS4 permit requirements and also help meet our countywide action plan for clean waters, nitrogen reduction goals. Um, it's a really good um, cooperative effort that we're having there. Thank you, Pam. Danny, you had something to contribute. Um, I think um, one of the most uh, interesting um, kind of pieces that I, I wanted, you know, wanted to highlight was that a lot of the times um, governments, uh, state level governments have various shared services programs and initiatives that allow folks to collaborate, you know, or share resources for like infrastructure management, roads, bridges, culverts. And there's the kind of attendant prioritization of culverts, bridges, and roads for repair. I think that this represents a very kind of interesting opportunity to partner with local highway departments to implement water quality BMPs and project areas that are already um, being evaluated and having, and also their engineer and design kind of schematics and plans are being drawn up. So I think that typically a lot of local budgets go towards highway anyway. So well, I'm really interested, you know, especially in New York, for communities to start using their highway budgets to incorporate a Chesapeake Bay program BMPs too, and particularly in high value watersheds. It's a pre pretty easy way to kill two birds with one stone. Um, actually, there was a couple of questions in the chat, but one of them that really um, I don't think we've addressed at all is um, how your jurisdiction has dealt with racism and, um, and environmental justice. Um, and I'd, I'd really think it's, it's vital that we answer those questions. And if you have anything specific, um, uh, I think our participants and I would love to hear if you're addressing that, any of that, please. I, I think, um, you know, at, at least in our neck of the woods in Otsego County, um, the Otsego County Conservation Association is actively participating in trainings with the Choose Clean Water Coalition, which covers the entire Chesapeake Bay service area. And so our main thing that we're trying to do is examine our institutional and organizational biases and develop like um, internal, um, I guess, um, policies and practices that take into account uh, DEIJ principles and do as much self-education as possible. Um, in terms of environmental justice in particular, um, in terms of rural environmental justice, we're trying to con you know, constantly advocate for state level resources and county level resources to be dedicated to underserved rural areas and communities. 
uh, that may not typically be able to participate in you know, a high level policy decisions, but may be very interested in doing so. It's a little bit different. It's, it's more, I call it like technical, uh, you know, a disparity in technic technical capabilities. And we don't want um, areas, particularly large rural areas to be left out of the planning processes around water quality and water quality protection in general. Thanks, Danny. Um, anybody else have a contribution? If not, I'm going to have to let's we're going to wrap up this panel because um, I see um, Mayor Gore is on online, so I need to go ahead. So any other contribution in terms of environmental justice, please? Um, I'll just, send, send that. Oh, go everybody. Ahead. Go ahead, Michelle. Let's hear from all of you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I was just going to say in my neck of the woods in more rural Virginia, um, septic systems tends to be one area that definitely targets low income communities. They receive more cost share funding. Um, so that's, for example, one area. Usually it is um, agriculture and septic are the things that really try to target more low income areas in my neck of the woods, um, being a rural community, it's very hard in some senses to target where your rural, where your low income communities are. We're trying to work on this with DEQ to get down to brass tacks for the state to try to do a better job of addressing this issue. So look for that as we move forward. Um, this Pam, is you were going to say something? Just to... Yeah, we've hired oh, an equi equity and inclusion community planner to not only take a look at internally what we can do better um, to become a welcoming workplace, but um, we're also um, doing uh, a community side of that and looking out into the community um, at what municipalities are doing as well as uh, nonprofits and you know how we can educate more about the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion as a part of all um, local policies and, and implementation measures. So um, we're into the second year of that. So we're, um, the county also just completed its strategic plan and that kind of idea came out on top of one of the needs both internally and through a community survey that we did. So we're going to, um, like I said, we're now um, working on a plan to, to how to do that in the community. So um, thank you, Pam. I have a question from uh, to the panel from uh, June Park. Uh, I'm going to unmute you or you can unmute yourself. I think, June, um, to the panel. June should be able to unmute themselves and then ask the question. Thank you, um, that uh, Martina, that's great. Uh, go ahead, June. Uh, I, I can't hear her. Okay. June, I can see that you're unmuted, um, but we're having trouble hearing you. So you might just wanna submit your question in the chat box. Yeah, let's go ahead and do that. Um, Martina, are we moving on to the, or Laura, are we moving on to- um, we, uh, we are. Mayor yeah, Gore. We're gonna do that, but we do have time for just one more question that came in oh, good. early. Uh, and uh, so you may have, may have not noticed it, so I'll just uh, speak it out loud. It says, what techniques do you use to inspire residents of New York and Pennsylvania to care about the Chesapeake Bay when these states do not have direct access to the bay, unlike Maryland, Delaware, Virginia, and the District of Columbia? I think that's probably something you can all relate to, even uh, uh, because we all have parts of the state that aren't directly in the bay. So do folks want to take a shot at that one? Um. You know, the most effective um, thing um, that I tell people is people are really in, you know, in upstate New York are really motivated by taxes. Um, and what I tell people is, you know, you already pay 
for to protect water quality through all sorts of various state and federal programs. Um, and there's a whole bunch of people in the Chesapeake Bay program, EPA, um, other states, uh, other stakeholder committees that are, you know, basically sitting there waiting to help you. So if you already paid for something, what, you know, what's to stop you from taking advantage of it? It's a pretty simple rhetorical question. Um, you know, kind of more specifically, you know, folks are very responsive to protecting farms, repairing roads and bridges. And oftentimes you can find substantial co-benefits with the Bay program. And if you, you know, especially establish connections with people working in the Chesapeake Bay program who can provide technical assistance to our communities, it creates a really good working relationship. So we don't really, we tend to take the Bay out of our discussion, but mainly frame it in, um, you know, a large federal program that is intended to protect water quality in our region. And that people are basically throwing money at us and want us and want to work with us. And it makes people in our area feel included and excited about water quality protection. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, Danny. And uh, Michelle, Mark, uh, Michelle noted in the chat, I hope everyone saw that, that um, flooding programs usually are really helpful um, and provide funding. I, I know um, we used um, um, funds from um, FEMA to redo a lot of our floodplain mapping. And then we were able to show um, you know, where we needed to um, really give assistance. So that was very helpful. Uh, any other questions? Is that, is that June? There's Jasmine. Oh, good. Okay, Mayor Gore. <laughs> um, I think I'm going to wrap up this, this panel. Um, I want to thank uh, Pam and Michelle and, and Danny and Mark. Um, you did a really yeoman's job in answering these questions. And I think that since you're going to be able to see this recording, but you'll have also access to the panelists. So there, if there's any further questions about specifics of what a jurisdiction's doing, if a jurisdiction's next to you, it's in your state or whatever, I think they'd be happy, these panelists be happy to answer your questions and things like that. Um, thank you all very, very much. And I'm going to go ahead and um, introduce um, our next um, um, honoree here um, is Mayor Jasmine Gore. And this is a distinct pleasure that I have because um, I really, as I read this, her bio, I'm, I'm just um, really so blown away by all she's done in such a young time, uh, such a short period of time. In November, 2012, um, Jasmine Gore made history with the city of Hopewell and the, Common and the Commonwealth of Virginia during the municipal elections just two years after obtaining a dual bachelor's degree in biology and political science from Virginia Commonwealth University, VCU. Ms. Gore became, become, became the second 26 year old to sit on Hopewell city council. Since being elected, Ms. Gore has served in various local state and national leadership positions, most notably Ms. Gore served as a board of directors member of for the National League of Cities and at large member um, for with the National Black Caucus of local elected officials. She also served as the only elected official on the Virginia Board of Medicine and is currently serving her second term on the local government advisory committee for the executive council of the Chesapeake Bay. Ms. Gore's love for science is a cornerstone of her advocacy, and she's also served on VCU's College of Humanities and Science Advisory Board. This is so wonderful. Ms. Gore has also uh, has over 10 years of government experience, beginning as a city appointed volunteer, intern for the uh, Virginia uh, General Assembly, and now a local elected official. November 2020. Ms. Gore had the honor of being appointed to serve as mayor of the city of Hopewell. In this capacity, she has served as the youngest African-American and female member within the Commonwealth of Virginia. During her tenure, Mayor Gore received um, municipal grants designed to address social um, determinants of health, access to opportunity and social economic factors. She advocated for the city's participation in the governor's health equity initiative during COVID-19, led a charge to provide residents with PPE programs and tax relief, tax relief during the pandemic. Additional accomplishments include the establishment of a youth workforce program, addressing the digital divide, establishing an uh, 
Early Childhood Task Force, championing open government access software and spearheading a new citywide strategic plan. Ms. Gore was noted as the next generation of government by the National Elected Official Organization and selected as an emerging leader of the year for the state party within Virginia. She has proven to both uh, diligent and innovative at addressing the needs of the city of Hopewell. Ms. Gore promotes, advocates, and creates programs and legislation to create a citizen-driven goals to move whoops, uh, the city of Hopewell forward. Her single greatest achievement in office to date is a successful reinstatement of the City of Hopewell's Office of Youth and um, Youth Commission. Welcome, Mayor um, Gore. Ha so happy to have you with us. Thank you uh, for having me. I appreciate this. Um, definitely say I'm a little nervous that you read all of that out loud. <laughs> <laughs> I had to, it was so wonderful. <laughs> I wanted Thank everyone you. to hear it. <laughs> Thank you. I do have one disclaimer. Um, as of January, I'm no longer the mayor. We do reorganization every two years, um, okay. but people still call me that. So it's okay. I just don't want people, they go to our website and be like, well, I thought, um, <laughs> I do appreciate that. So um, it, I think it would be great if you talk about um, how how you, since your background is biology and, and political science, you kind of combine the two two spectrums there, how the city of Ho um, Hopewell has really addressed environmental issues and and the, um, that would be really, really helpful. Oh, absolutely. Um, at any point in time, please feel free to cut me off if I'm going on too long or need clarity or have additional questions for sure. Um, the city of Hopewell is interesting because we were known as one of the chemical capitals of the South um, years <laughs> ago. Uh, we actually made national news when we had a large chemical spill here um, in Hopewell, and it's from Keepone. Um, and so it pretty much contaminated our, our water supply. Uh, for those who are not familiar, we're, we're located, we're 30 minutes south of Richmond. We are where the Appomattox and the James Rivers meet. So we're at the confluence of both of those rivers. And so even to this day, you'll still hear people say like, the water's not safe and hopeful. And it's like, yes, it is, yes, it is. But that just lets you know how long these types of things really stay in the community, which is why it's really important to do the work to let people know how incredibly vital it is to have clean and safe water. Um, Hopewell, I would say probably about last four years, um, thanks to our wonderful staff and also members of council who actually believe in doing this work, have really tried to put an emphasis on being cognizant on how we address environmental factors. And so in Virginia, as you know, we might, we have to do a comprehensive plan every four to five years per state law. And that's like our land use document, economic developers, um, city staff, everyone uses this document as a, a guiding practice for how we're gonna use our land property. Um, our last adoption of that, I think we did it in 2019, um, we added a new chapter for Chesapeake Bay and a whole chapter on health. And the reason why we add that in our land use document is kind of, you know, kind of the talking points that we heard today is making sure we address how are we, um, one, protecting our environment, but then also thinking about the impact that it has on our residents. So the Chesapeake Bay chapter clearly talks about all Chesapeake related things, um, but then also the health chapter, and I heard a couple comments and questions earlier, uh, we talk about city planning and design because that impacts your residents' health. So, you know, if are you zoned by industry? Because we have a lot of industry here. Is, is your is it residential beside industry? If so we need to work on a plan to phase that out. Um, what about access to clean and safe water, whether it be for recreational use or for drinking use? We talk about actual conditions of housing. So part of that is redoing our rental inspection program to make sure we address mold and other environmental factors. We talk about complete streets. Uh, we are a complete street city. We passed a resolution. So we're, we, you know, we looked at all of downtown in particular to try and make sure that was more accessible. Do we have sidewalks in neighborhoods? Uh, do we have wheel, wheel, um, wheelchair ramps? You know, we also think about other things when it comes to accessibility in terms of being a walkable and bikeable community. So we just recently adopted a 
walk and bike path plan. Um, we also, when we're doing our infrastructure projects, we started including um, built-in pathways for the bikes when we're doing new development. And when it comes to uh, widening a road or repaving a road, we're starting to incorporate that. And even some communities, we're putting paths for people to walk through. And so um, generally what I'm trying to relay is we've been trying to be conscious about what, I, what we kind of term as health in all policies, uh, putting in how are we looking at some of the legislative items that we have to accomplish or projects and think about its impact on the environment, but then also the health of our constituents. Uh, thank you so much. You, you are doing um, an amazing job. Um, I guess too, uh, um, are, so are you still on the council, even though yes. you're not mayor? Yes. Good, good, yes. good. Because you, you used the we, so I figured that you were still <laughs> you were still participating in all this. I'm um, still there. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask um, if any of our panelists have any questions for you, and and uh, um, in terms of um, you know how you're tackling. Uh, I, I know uh, Mark is is part of a small jurisdiction. Well, just let me ask: How big is Hopewell? Hopewell is 11 square miles. We are almost an island because we're surrounded by water on three sides. So we're 11 square miles. Um, about 24,000 people we'll have to look oh, wow. back at the new census <laughs> numbers. We're a small community, but we're mighty. Um, and uh, I do want to share one other thing, if I sure. may. Um, there was a question when I was switching back from the audience side to the panelist side about if I understood correctly, the difficulty in trying to get people and organizations to understand the importance of supporting the watershed when they're the bay in particular when they're not a part of it. We struggle with that in LGAC. Um, and that's why, you know, we have these bus tours that um, our uh, staff liaisons and other partners are hosting. We have one coming up um, this year that we're really excited about. But the purpose of these bus, we do like these bus tours where you have elected officials and strategic partners get on the bus and they go through the watershed and they go to a location and along the way they stop and talk about the impact um, that it has on the bay and I think that that's one really great tool to open up people's eyes in regards to the impact that they have but then also understand the struggle because even though we're here in Hopewell they're like well we're not a part of that yes we are <laughs> and I think the key is to try to break it down to where people can understand is necessarily not just what you think about when you consider the bay I'm really talking about how the waterways are connected but then also breaking it down to the term that in my opinion really impacts people when they understand hey when your water is flooding in front of your home that's because we need to put Put investments into our watershed and how we uh, do things. When you have um, algae blooms or you know other things, you can't go into the river. That you know that's what we need to be focusing on. And so I think one of the key things, or even during the pandemic when people were stuck inside of their homes, a lot of people, as you know, went out to parks and try to get some fresh air because that was safe. We'll explain to them if you want to be able to come and do things like this, we got to protect our environment. And so I think breaking it down to where people can see and feel really makes a difference if they don't really understand like the scientific part about it. Um, and someone said, can you talk about the water channel? Hopeful, absolutely. Uh, so we have our river walk, which is amazing. Um, I have to say, uh, it's downtown in our city. Um, it is across from our Beacon Theater, which is a a, a regional. Well, it's not a regional. We're trying to make it be a regional theater, but it's historic um, theater and in our library. And so there's a nice big field where we kind of have, we call it city park. We do outdoor events when, you know, they, they were safe and able to be done. <laughs> yeah. um, but outside, across from the field, we have a nice walkway where you have a wildfire, um, wildflower garden um, and butterfly garden. And then there's some outdoor play stuff for, for youth. And the cool thing about that play material is it looks like trees. So it's meant to blend into the environment and also be safe. Um, but then after that, we have a nice walking trail and we have a creek. So we talk about the importance of creeks. Um, and then along the way, we have signage that talks about what is the foliage in the area where the, the you know, the animals in the area, um, the importance of not littering and things like that. But the river walk, and there, I should get dinged for this. I don't know. I can't remember the exact um, length of it. I think it's a mile. Uh, it goes down the coast of our river. And so there's a pier as well where you can go out and fish, but then there's also these nice cutouts. So um, when you're walking, you want to take a break. There's a nice cutout where it's enough to seat 
about 10 people. So you get like a, a visual on the river and then you can keep going down the, the way. The goal is that we are going to connect that trail um, to go kind of around the city to where our marina is. We have a nice, we have two marinas in our city, but one is a city owned marina. And so the goal is to connect the first phase that we have completed to the second phase, which we're gonna start work on very soon. So that way when people come in, they can dock their boat and hop on the river walk. Um, but also we have our river walk going behind our hospital and by some restaurants. And so the idea would be to connect them to downtown. So you can simply walk, um, go to catch a, a show, um, check out some downtown shops <clears throat> and just really interact with the community. Um, and we saw a lot of people come out and use that during the pandemic, which um, the last thing I'll say is really important. We talk about equity because communities that probably would never have thought to go down to the river um, have been out there. And then also we have people from outside of our community coming down just to see the river walk. And the Bay did a nice write-up about it. And there's a video too. Um, I don't know if Ms. Starr can get access to that, but if we can drop that in the chat. That'd be awesome for you to see. I think Will Parsons did it. Oh, that sounds, that sounds wonderful. I know, um, I think your point about um, showing people the watershed and how it's connected and, um, and doing it through a bus tour or do a video. Um, I know uh, my county commissioner did a video for LGAT to show exactly what the county was doing um, when he was a member of LGAT. So I think the visuals and the participation are so, so vital. Otherwise they just don't understand how things are connected. Um, actually they, they put the link in, so that's great. <laughs> Thank you. And you have a fishing pier, I see that, okay. Um, Okay, do, do any of our, our panelists have any questions for um, Ms. Gore? That'd be great. Hi, I have, um, I have one. Um, and Mary Gore, it's good to see you again. You want to say hi. <laughs> um, I'm missing you at LGAC. I'm sure we'll be running into each other again soon. Um, yes. But, I, but I, I, I remember, you know, being a fellow elected myself, actually, um, I wanted wondering if you could talk about how you were able to kind of um, achieve consensus on environmental protection in your tenure as mayor. I know it can be, political discussions can be tough, but like, what was your approach to consensus building, um, particularly around contentious issues like water quality and environmental protection and stuff? That's, that's a great question, Danny. <laughs> um, one thing I definitely would say also, I forgot to say, when we have kayak launches too. So that way we're trying to expand the outdoor recreation. Um, in terms of building consensus, you're exactly right. Now everybody thinks that these things are important, especially environmental stuff always, in my opinion, kind of is at the bottom of the list, along with the arts <laughs> and things like that. Um, but I think that we were fortunate that we had our director of planning who understood the importance of this work. Um, and so she championed our planning commission to include the Chesapeake Bay chapter and solicited support in the community from um, a doctor that we're working with on a grant right now actually for um, social determinants of health to explain to them the importance of looking at planning and design from a health standpoint. And then given our history, as a city when it comes to the chemical spills and some of the mis you know the stigmas along with it it was it was the easier <clears throat> nudge to do um i think that some of the consensus building is honestly due to the trends that we're seeing across government you know before usually one one party paid attention to a lot of these uh issues or the regulations and things like that but now it's become an issue where all parties are looking at it. And so the perspective in which um, elected officials are viewing these things, I think there's an opportunity to find common ground. Um, because let's say, for example, we talk about flooding and sea level rise. At first you really hear certain groups talking about it, but now it impacts businesses. It impacts these larger um, communities. And so now you start to have conversations on both sides of the aisle. So I think that one is just the nature of the trends in terms of like politically where things are headed and you can't ignore some things anymore. But then also I think it's because um, you also have stuff happening in regards to access to clean and safe water where it's pushing the conversation. Um, I think that also 
going back to, um, I guess the example I relate about trying to let people see it and feel the impact is what makes a difference as well. Because you could talk circles around someone or, or you know, talking to your blue in the face and it still doesn't matter, but you put them out in front of a situation and they have a different perspective. Or if they can see and talk to people affected by something, it has a different perspective. Um, I think that makes a big difference. But then also um, <clears throat> there's this saying from that show called House of Cards. I, I remember uh, how, do you, how do you devour an elephant one bite at a time? You got to take little chunks until you can get other people to be on board with a, with the vision. Um, and right now, like for us, our anchor was clearly the river. The river walk was the anchor <clears throat> that we can build consensus on. And then now, I would definitely say it's stormwater um, because we have a lot of flooding in our neighborhoods that we're getting people to get consensus on because they're trying to make sure the residents don't complain about their yards flooding. And so, like, okay, you want to fix this? Then you got to talk about these projects. And here's why this is important. And you can start layering it. Um, I hope that answers your question, but. You know, I think it's either small bites or there needing to be a problem that needs to be fixed in order for you to really get consensus, unfortunately. So, Thank you, um, that was a great answer. <laughs> That's a great you. answer. And um, I did wanna mention that um, you were talking about tours and things like that and uh, for uh, best management practices, BMPs. Um, and Pam had mentioned that they had, they used to do a BMP tour, but they did now a self-guided tour. So you, because of COVID and people aren't going together in buses or anything else. So you can, we, we've had to learn to adapt to those things, but the self-guided tours, um, you know, and the trails that we create for people to, to, uh, to really understand. And sometimes that's even better because they, they can do it at their own pace and things like that, as long as you have a guided tour. So and yeah, even I think staff that, can do it with, I'm sorry to cut you off. Even staff no, can no. do it. <clears throat> with their local elected officials, right? Because um, I'm not gonna lie, I just, uh, a couple months ago, our city engineer, I was like, I don't see any neighborhood projects in your recommended, recommended um, flooding plan. I was like, I'm not gonna vote for this because I don't see neighborhood projects. And he was like, but Jasmine, they're there. And I'm like, where, where, right? And so um, we had like this heated exchange um, and then he broke it down where he was like, I hear you, I, I get what you're saying. He said, but I cannot do these unless I do this. And they did, we did a tour um, and then I can understand what he was talking about with his infrastructure projects that he needed to get done first before we could start trickling down to the projects that were really most important to me. And having even that with staff breaking it down and said, let me show you what I'm talking about. Come out here with me and let me, let me show you why this is, needs to be done this way. It also makes a difference. Okay, well, um, I want to thank you so much for being with us, and it it was uh, a real treat to um, have you on board for this, and and uh, having a local official, somebody with with the background that we they um, you have represented, and um, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I'm I'm going to now turn it over to Laura Batchel for the um, to close up and to give any final information that you all may need. Um, um, but thank you, Jessica. Thank you. Thank you. That was really wonderful. I really do appreciate it. Um, so, and it also just leads me right into um, some next steps on the webinar series. Um, there was a lot of resources mentioned today. So I wanted to let you know, we do have this slide uh, that has links to some of the resources that were mentioned um, and we'll have that available to you um, so that you can uh, look at those. Um, but it also helps me go right back into our next webinar, uh, which we've already uh, spoken about uh, a fair amount, and that's Plan Integration for Resilience and Equity, which is gonna be one month from today, Thursday, February 17th. Uh, we'll be hearing from panelists who are talking about plan integration and how they're using that to, uh, to address equity issues as well. And then the one following that is going to be on hazard mitigation and water quality co-benefits. So we're hoping that we uh, see you back here next month, a month after that, and so on and so forth. So thanks so much. This was fantastic. I really appreciate it. See you next month. Thank you. <laughs>